righty, friends and neighbors and folks in other parts of the world and folks in this part of the world, um, folks in any part of the world, doesn't really matter, because this is the information age and we are all connected. We are all one spiritual each other on social media. <laughs> Hello. Hi, I'm Tad. I'm here. I'm going to be reading, um, mostly for the next hour, roughly. Um, and, uh, before I do that, I'm going to talk just for a little bit, although I don't have much to talk about again. Um, but it's nice to see you all. Whoops. It's nice to see you all. Anyway, I have to find a better place for that microphone. Um, I keep hitting it. That's my gesturing hand. That's a problem. Um, anyway, so let me know that one content is not available. Well, that's a lot of help. So what have we got here? Yay, we've actually got comments. And look, people have actually showed up. So let me say hello to some of them quickly before they disappear again. Penny, hello, Penny, good to see you. Christy, hi, Christy. Chris, good morning, good morning. Iris, a pleasure. Good morning, day, evening to you too. Mark, hello, good morning. Kristen, a pleasure to see you as always. Wouter, good morning. Dirk, hello, hello. Um, a pleasure to have you as well. And Carol, hello, hello. Carol Aitken, very nice. Nikki, um, I haven't been in Leicestershire in a long time. I had some very interesting experiences there. And Nicole, hello, Nicole, good to see you. Um, I'm trying to think about if there's like anything really much to talk about um, this week. And unfortunately, there's not particularly, I mean, not unfortunately, probably luckily for everybody. Um, but, you know, it's just more of the same here. I'm, I'm when I can, because it seems like things just keep happening all the time that prevent me from get that idea because, you know, be totally wrong. Twitch, Twitch. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, it is frustrating. It is frustrating, but it's just the way life is. Life is, you know, as John Lennon said, life is what happens when you're making, you've made other plans. Um, I've always, I'm always making plans to work. That's really what I need to do many hours a week. And then things just keep happening, whether they are small domestic crises, um, requiring either something to be fixed or somebody to be called in who knows what they're doing to fix something. Um, you know, many things having to do with still with the move and various related projects. And then when I occasionally can find time, oh, and of course, you know, my, my dad's health and my brothers and I and our wives all trying to, you know, rally around to get dad's stuff taken care of and make sure everything's okay for him. Um, which I have to say, my brothers and sisters-in-law have been brilliant. Um, they really, you know, I mean, Ah, I know it's kind of a cliche, but you know, I mean, when your family is there for you, you know, it's, it, it really is a big thing. It really is a big thing. And, and, um, this has been a tough year for the family, but everybody has really rallied. Um, and uh, I'm just so proud of them and proud to be, uh, to be related to them either by blood or by marriage or whatever. <laughs> Um, anyway, so my my family, my brothers and their wives are good people. Um, what else? Uh, oh, and then when I occasionally get a moment to, you know, just a s occasional spare moment, um, I go back to my actual work, the stuff that I have to do if we're going to, you know, eat, have a roof over our heads. Um, and uh, that, as I s think I was telling last week, is super bitty. I was just complaining about it to Deb today. It's It's... You know, I don't know. I can't even think of something to compare it to, except it's like doing math problems, doing complicated math problems for hours at a stretch, which if you're a math person, I'm sure that's fun. Just like I'm a literary person and solving complicated literary problems for hours at a stretch doesn't bother me at all. I do that happily. But this kind of stuff is this, which is, has to do with dates and phases of the moon and making things consistent and how far apart things are and how long it would take different groups of people to travel and therefore what day of the, this must be when this happens and how does that compare to the, you know, that is, um, let's just put it this way. As I said to Deb today, that's like actual work and I don't like working. 
<laughs> it's not my favorite thing to do. Um, you know, it's it's you can't say, oh, I'm going to go research this. I mean, because I've already done the research. I've done the research on this stuff. Horse and rider can travel. I know how far my versions of these things can work. I know how far roughly things are apart. Um, so it's, uh, <laughs> I can't even use the excuse of research, which has gotten me out of other kinds of boring work before. So anyway, when possible, I am just grinding along on that stuff. Fortunately, it's not going to take that much longer. Um, what else? What else? I, I was having a bit of, um, a bit of uh, old guy self-pity in the last week because I've seen two, two stories in the last however long, last few weeks about um, people who, writers, who had a book signing and nobody showed up. Um, and in both cases, one was a youngish woman who was, had written, I don't know if it was her first book or not, but she had written a book and had a, a you know, a book signing that nobody showed up to or very few did. And similarly, a, a gentleman more middle, middle of middle age, um, who has also written a book and was out doing a signing and nobody showed up. And both of them had posted something about this on social media were not only bombarded with with um, kind wishes and words of support and all that um, but uh, you know lots of other writers you know had come and had pointed people in their direction and had you know tried to help out in a number of different ways which is all great you know i mean i'm i'm totally in favor of that but i just think i had lots of those when i started out and there was no internet and there were no social media friends <laughs> i just had to i just had to bare knuckle my way through those the white knuckle my way through those things and some of them were ghastly indeed back in the old days is, for instance, if you did a signing in a mall bookstore, and a lot of the bookstores were places like B. Dalton and stuff like that in, in America anyway, um, and uh, they would, you know, sometimes put you at a table out in front of the bookstore, you were out in the mall and weren't, except for the fact that you'd be sitting at a table with maybe a pile of books on it, and maybe if it was really embarrassing with your name on a little pl placard sitting in front of you, you're just sitting out in the mall. And it, you know, so if people didn't come, it was god awful because there weren't even any bookstore employees to talk to you. Every now and then one might come out and go, oh, would you like some coffee or something? And you go, no, never mind. Coffee's not gonna help this. And, um, I, I mean, I remember people would come up and ask me where the restrooms were, you know, because I was sitting at a table. I guess they thought I was a security guard or something. I don't know. Um, little old ladies would come up and ask if you were giving away free samples and you'd have to say, no, I'm afraid these are actually books for sale. I'm, I wrote them. And they... But the worst of all was the really nice little old ladies who would like feel so sorry for you. They'd like think about buying a, oh, I should buy one. You know, oh, I hate to see you standing out here or sitting out here by yourself, you know, and they'd spend like 10 minutes. They were not interested in the book at all. They're just feeling sorry for you, you know, and you, you, you don't want to discourage anybody and you certainly don't want to discourage a potential customer. But on the other hand, there's only so much pity that you can have dripped on you <laughs> before you start to go, look, ma'am, please, you don't have to buy a book. Honest to God. I mean, I, you know, unfortunately by the latter group of bad book signings, um, you know, I've been well enough known that I can say to myself, look, thousands of people are buying these books. I know they are. So the fact that nobody showed up today is not something that I have to feel bad about. But in those early days when you had a book signing like that, and you know, I think any established writer probably has had a few and I had several um, where one person shows up or whatever, you know. And you desperately keep them there as long as you can, pumping them for conversation just because, like, you know, you know when they leave, you're going to be the only person sitting out in front of that stupid B. Dalton's again. Um, anyway, so as I said, this I, I totally support the fact that these people got all kinds of positive vibes from their their online posts. I'm not wishing them anything else but success and happiness. But I'm kind of, there's a part of me that's like, where was that for me? I just did. Nobody told me anything. You know, I didn't have anybody telling me, oh, it gets better or anything like that. I was just sitting out there being an object of, of shame and pity for bookstore employees. Oh, poor bastard hasn't had anybody all day. Yeah, well, I don't know. Go offer him some coffee. <laughs> anyway, 
let me see before I start reading if anybody else has shown up that I should say hello to. And let me see who we got. Tash. Tash. Tash says, if you ever come back to Australia, I promise there'll be heaps at my signing. Oh, I really want to come back to Australia. I miss Oz. Um, oh, there's my friend Ivan. Hello, Ivan. Good to see you, buddy. And let me see who else. Nicole, I said hello to. Christina, I didn't say hello to. So hello, Christina. Um, return from a vacation in Provence. Very nice. Very nice. I'm jealous. Uh, we are going to probably make it to England this year, but we are not going to make it to France, let alone to Provence. Uh, even saying it is lovely. Provence. Uh, anyway, winter. Hello. Good to see you. Um, there are times when I think seriously winter about moving to New Zealand. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I don't think we're going to be moving anywhere right now. But there, there are times when New Zealand calls to me. I hear its siren song. Uh, Holger. Hello, Holger. Good to see you. I already said hello to you, Ivan, but I'll say it again. Hello. We were just talking about you not too long ago, about two weeks ago over dinner. And uh, we discussed you quite a bit. Nothing, nothing bad was said, only that we missed you and wished you were around. Andre, hello, good to see you too. Petra, hello, hello. And Petra says, Ich versuche gerade iPad und iPhone und hat auf meinen Laptop gehört. Ärgerlich. Ärgerlich. That's the only person, that's the only word I don't recognize. Ich versuche, suche. Gerade iPad und iPhone or iPod und iPhone. Anyway, I'll figure it out later. Um, <laughs> she's not talking to me, but that's okay. Um, Wouter, I would love to come back to the Netherlands. I haven't been to the Netherlands in, God, like since 2017 or maybe longer than that, but it was a while. Um, so let us, let us, let us, let us um, keep that as a possibility. Uh, and Winter's offering me a spare room. Thank you. Very kind. Oh, and there's my mother-in-law, Hazel. Good morning, Hazel. Good to see you, however, at whatever distance, however virtually. Your daughter is fine. Um, she was in fine fettle this evening, and uh, she is currently snoozing, but she's doing quite well. Um, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. As I said, hello to everybody who's left a message here. I think so. There are probably others, but I'm not seeing. Ah, Tony has shown up. Hello, hello. Petra, I knew that wasn't for me. I was just checking to see if, I, if my German still worked. Um, so Tony Graham checked in. Hello. Good evening, sir. Good to see you. And Rosalba also has checked in. So with that, since I don't have much to report this week, since things are not particularly jumping um, in any sense that I can talk about and go, oh, and this is new and that's new. Just the usual. There's still idiots setting off fireworks tonight. I don't know what the hell their problem is. Um, I mean, for God's sakes, it's, you know, it's 12 days after the 4th of July and you're still setting off fireworks. Get a real job. Um, anyway, this is, of course, much exacerbated for me because every time they do, our dog goes into the shower or, or starts scratching on, you know, closed doors, trying to find a sanctuary somewhere. Sanctuary! Um, just like Quasimodo. So, uh, let me think. Yeah, I think that's really about it. I'm just working on stuff and dealing with stuff and it's crazy, but it's always crazy. Um... The last thing I will leave you with is the, the realization that I think I might have mentioned a couple of weeks ago, which is that I realized that this illusory idea of being caught up that's always in the back of my mind, you know, it's like if I do this and then that and that and get that done, I'll be caught up. And then I stop and think about it and I realize I've been telling myself this. I remember distinctly telling myself this back when I was living in England. And that was in the early 1990s. If I just do this, this, and this, I'll be caught up. And you know what? It didn't happen. It hasn't happened since. I've been telling myself that for 30 years or more, more probably. That's just the first time I remember. And uh, I've never been caught up. I never will be caught up. I am caught up in being caught up. And that's the only way I will ever be <laughs> caught up is by worrying about it 
um, but it's a different meaning of the phrase, obviously. But in terms of actually getting to the point where I don't have anything hanging over my head, as soon as I did that, an entire Pandora's box of other things that I haven't even tried to do, like catching up on all my old email messages. I get email messages on social media all the time and I can't answer any of them because I can barely make it through the day and work the work I do and do the parenting and husbanding, um, you know, let alone all the nice people who've written me emails, you know, and have never gotten a reply, not because I looked at them and went, oh, who cares what they think? It's because I've looked at them and gone, there's 25 more, and I was hundreds behind yesterday, and now there's 25 more. And at a certain point, you just give up. And I'm afraid, <laughs> I hate to say it, but I'm pretty much afraid that's what I've done with a lot of these kinds of things. So even if I got caught up on all my writing projects and my household projects and my long-term projects, you know, the things that I'm going, oh, if I had more time, I'd do this. Um, you know, I'd get back to practicing the guitar, the bass again, I'd be doing this. Even I got all those things out of the way, I would have this raft of other stuff just waiting that I haven't even tried to do. So this whole idea of getting caught up is completely illusory. It's, it's a hamster wheel, but it's a hamster wheel with the illusion of progress. See, a hamster wheel, you can just get in and just run just for the exercise, and that's fine. And if you're just going through your daily grind with the notion that this is what I'm doing today, it's my daily grind, um, you're okay. But as soon as you start to think, I'm falling farther behind, <laughs> as I've been thinking for 30, 40 years now, oh my God, I'm farther behind than I was when I started today. You're doomed. You're doomed. You're never, because you're never going to get caught up. It ain't going to happen. Um, and that's something it's taken me a long time to learn, but I have finally at least begun to realize that that was probably the case. Um, and as such, I, I feel slightly more free than I did. I'm <sighs> sad sack and miserable about the quality and quantity of my working time. And that's just life, you know. I chose to have a family. I chose to have kids. I chose to have uh, interaction with the world. And, you know, invariably, you're, these, are, these things are trade-offs. These are trade-offs. You can't have kids and animals and a house and, you know, uh, a, a relationship, a partner and all that stuff without putting time and energy into them. And they are all very important to me. So is my career, but it's not more important. Not starving to death is mildly more important, but the rest of it is not more important than you know, family, friends, all that stuff. So all this by way of saying, I know it's hopeless, folks. Don't, 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 don't disabuse me of, of the notion that I, you know, I, 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 I don't need to be disabused of the notion that I will never, ever, ever actually, I am, I am okay. I'm okay with that knowledge. Anyway, let me go back to Brothers of the, we were reading, and uh, after a disastrous attempt to locate the dragon, where they found the dragon, or rather the dragon found them, and several people were, several of their people, several of the Sithi and uh, whatnot were killed, and some of the mortals were killed, and many others were injured. And they had a uh, decision to make on where to go, and they went to Mezutua, or the Silver Home, which is the Sithi city underneath. Uh, a mountain in Hernestir. Um, but again, Inazashi, the, the master, the protector of Silverhome, turned them down for help, but did help take care of the wounded. The uh, mortals and the Sithi have parted ways, the mortals returning back to their, their mortal home. Um, and one of the uh, Sithi who were helping to take care of them when they first got away from the dragon, suggested they go see Lord Zaniko, um, who Sithi's relatives, the Norns. He is one of the Norns, and he has fought dragons. And since um, Inaluki refuses to go back to Azua and refuses to give up until the dragon is dead because he made this stupid oath and people died because of it, 
Um, because of that, his brother Hakatri and Hakatri's servant, Pamun Kes, who is our narrator, cannot go home either because they don't dare leave Inaluki alone. So that is what they are arguing about now after they have left Lady Vinadarta and the Skyglass Lake clan. My master thought Lady Vinadarta's advice, which was to seek Zaniko. My master thought Lady Zinadarta's advice good, but Inaluki did not, though he could suggest no plan of his own. Because of this uncertainty, we rode only a short distance that day, as far as the crossing, where the road to Skyglass Lake met the Westwood track that followed the line of mountains. Then, they, then we stopped to settle on the direction for our journey from there, north toward Zaniko's high castle, or south toward the Silver Way and Serpent's Vale. Ordinarily, nothing would have been more important to me than this debate between the brothers, but I was troubled that day by many things. The scene at the sight of witness had bothered me deeply, like a sliver that had worked its way under my skin and could not be forced out again. Then, only that afternoon, Lady Vinadarta had wished the two brothers good fortune, without mentioning or even looking at me, as though I were no more than a beast, a horse or hound. Inazashi was one thing, a sour old tyrant, but Vinadarta was known as a wise, kind ruler. Was I invisible? Had I unwittingly done something to offend her, or was I simply not worth acknowledging? Just a brief reminder for Pamon Kess, who is narrating this. He is a Hakatri squire, but he is also Tanuka Daya. He is not of the Sithi. He is not a mortal. He is of another race called the Tanuka Daya, or sometimes known as changelings. And they are rather subordinate to the Sithi, at least at this particular time in history. No matter how I turned these questions over in my mind, I could make nothing useful of them, so I did my best to push them away. But turning my attention to the brothers' conversation did not bring me much cheer either. Back his ill-conceived oath, though he and I both knew that such a thing would never happen. When he could not convince his brother to forswear himself, my master insisted they should seek out the Hikadaya exile, Zaniko, as Vinadarta had suggested. What good could such a one do us? Inaluki demanded. No one has seen the exile since he left Nakiga in a fury. Everyone says that he is half mad, that he wants nothing to do with any of the folk of the garden, Hamaka or Saonsere. I care little what everyone says, Hakatri replied. I care only about what Zaniko knows. He was the last of our kind to kill a worm with his own hands. If you are so determined to honor this hasty pledge of yours, a rope that will drag it, at least me along with you, if not many others, then we must learn what we can about a worm this large and deadly. As long as your stubbornness and your ill-advised oath keeps you from returning home, and my own duty prevents me from leaving you, we have no choice but to seek for a way to destroy the black worm. Do not shame me with talk about your duty, said Inaluki bitterly. If you insist on making my oath your own, how can you fault me? And in any case, what secret knowledge can there be to killing a worm that no one knows except a minor Hikadaya noble who is driven out of Nakiga? The trick of staying alive, for one thing, Hakatri said, his fury only a little less than his brother's, though he spoke in a more restrained tone. You saw it. I saw it. That creature in the veil is so long it could not dip all of itself at once in the pool of three depths. But you refused to return to Azua, where memories of our people, both living and dead, could be searched for answers where we could find others to help us hunt the beast. What choice do we have but to ask the exile? I do not need... My master did not let him finish. You do not need. You do not want. Do you know any other words, brother? I have seldom seen Hakatri so angry. 
Why do you think we are here at all? Why does your beloved Yoe and a half dozen more of our folk lie unburied in a foul swamp? Because you thought only of yourself, of your anger, your pride. Do not chide me with their breaths, with... Do not chide me with their deaths, brother. In that rage-filled voice, I also heard a despair more agonizing than I had guessed. Make no mistake. I know whose fault this is. I know why those good folk are dead. What do you think drove me to that oath, if not the knowledge of my own terrible fault? But no one else needs to suffer because of my shameful, careless decision to seek the worm. Not you. Not Tariki Clearsight and your other friends. None of you. This burden is mine alone, and I do not need one of the Hekidaya to advise me either. Then you are a fool, Hakatri said bitterly. That is fair enough, his brother said, with a crooked smile that made me turn away, so painful was it to see. I have often lived as one, as you yourself have many times pointed out. It seems only proper that I should die one as well. Their quarreling went on so long that I fell asleep, then woke again in the darkest hours of the night in time to hear the resolution. Inaluki still would not take back his oath, but Hakatri won the argument about asking help from the renegade Zaniko. This reassured me a little. I had often seen their disagreements resolved this way. In fact, I think Inaluki often preferred his brother to be the one to decide what actions they should take, so that he was free to argue for whatever brave, vengeful, or foolish thing he wanted, knowing that it would be Hakatri's more cautious approach that would win in the end. But, as they both knew that night, and I knew too, it was still Inaluki's angry, poorly considered pledge that would drive us on to whatever fate awaited us. In the morning's light, the three of us set off, riding north. We followed the westward track as it wound along the foothills of the sun-stepped mountains, which loomed over us like a great thunderstorm frozen against the sky. We were headed for the northmost, northernmost peak of the range, called the Beacon. Through, though the season of renewal had begun, it had not quite reached this part of the world yet. The skies were gray, full of brief but cold rain showers, and the wind could not seem to make up its mind which direction to blow. No matter how I adjusted my cloak, I always felt a chill. We stopped the first night in a glen that reminded me of Serpent's Vale, though the main likeness was in the lonely silence that hung over the spot. Even the reassuring stars were hidden by the all-shrouding mist, in Aluki's oath, and what might come from it, weighed heavily on all of us. The brothers scarcely spoke after we stopped for the night, but sat staring into the fire long after I finally dropped into fitful sleep. We rode several more days, usually in silence, the stark shapes of the mountains looming always at our left, until we reached the farthest end of the range. The northern heights of the sun Step Mountains are rocky and steep, and except for the endless fields of heather and moss and bracken that close them, are mostly bare but for a few trees on the highest slopes. Fogs rise out of the ground, but not far, hanging close to the slopes. We often rode through murk so thick I could see nothing beyond the brothers' horses in front of me. As we reached the last cluster of peaks, the beacon tallest among them, we turned onto a smaller road that wound steeply uphill. Our horses had to tread carefully to avoid the deep ruts left by wagon wheels. My master told me that watchtowers with great signal fires had once stood at the top of the mountain, raised by the first Zidaya to travel into those empty lands. These earliest settlers had built their guard posts at the time the first mortal men began to cross over from the unknown west, but their early redoubts had long since crumbled away. 
After a long absence, a succession of both Zidiah and Hikadiah nobles had rediscovered the spot and made homes for themselves near the peak, even as mortal men spread across the moors below. Most of these immortals did not care much for company, I suppose, although not always for such obvious reasons as the beacon's current master. Still, despite the dreariness of its weather and its great isolation, this part of the world has a strange, raw beauty that has never quite let go of me since that first journey. I did not know much about Zaniko Sehamaka, the infamous Hikadaya noble we were on our way to see, except that he was a distant relative of Queen Utuku. She has lived so very, very long after the death of her only child that all of her living relatives are distant. But I learned more about him later on. Hello, John, I know. Johnny's come to join us. I know, you're being upset about the noise. It's okay. Can you sit down now, sweetie? Oh, careful, buddy. You lie down. It's okay. Sorry, he just pushed the door open and came in. Um, all right, hang on. We accidentally jumped ahead a page. I did not know much about Zaniko Sehamaka, the infamous Hikadaya noble we were on our way to see, except that he was a distant relative of Queen Utuku. She has lived so very, very long after the death of her only child that all of her living relatives are distant. But I learned more about him later on. Zaniko was infamous among his own people for something they called the Exile's Letter, a long and complex poem he had written before he left Nakiga. It was forbidden to Utuku's subjects to possess that poem, to read it, or even to mention it, but that had not prevented it becoming known by many among both Kedaya tribes, Hikidaya and Zidaya, especially my master's folk who did not have to fear execution for acknowledging its existence. Zaniko's poem spoke of living in a corrupt court under a ruler who had once been fair and good, but who had descended into vengefulness and cruelty. Although this ruler was never named in the poem, and the setting was clearly fanciful, perhaps because Zaniko still felt some small sympathy toward his clan Hamaka kin, no one doubted who was being denounced. And the exile escaped the stony fastness of Nakiga only a short hour ahead of the queen's teeth guards sent to arrest him. After wandering for many years and being rejected by my master's people as well, Zaniko at last settled atop the beacon, rebuilding an ancient castle now known as Raven's Perch. He had married, too, a matter of much talk and gossip among my master's folk, though as we rode up the wind winding way into the heights, I did not know why his choice of a bride so fascinated the Zidaya. As we climbed higher and higher up the mountain, I had trouble filling my lungs, though sea foam, as always, seemed tireless. We passed a few farms perched on terraces along the mountainside and saw animals pastured in many of the high meadows, but no sign of their mortal owners, as if visitors were not just a rarity in that high country, but something to be feared. The gloomy sky and the mists that clung to the hillside muted all the colors, and it was hard not to feel we rode through an alien world that did not care for us. Raven's Perch Castle stood, square and spare, on a high promontory where the earliest tower and its warning beacon had once stood. The castle's empty black windows looked out over the somber meadowlands that blanketed the mountain's foot. Its slate roof tiles gleamed with rain even in the dimness of late afternoon. I only realized later that the castle seemed positioned to watch especially for enemies from Nakiga in the north, Zaniko's old home. But Raven's Perch seemed to fear not just enemies, but any visitors at all hiding itself from the world with only a single main tower standing above its featureless walls of dark stone, like a suspicious face peering over a gate. A few armored guards stood atop those walls, the first creatures like ourselves that we had seen in some time, watching us in silence as we rode. 
To my surprise, the soldiers who stepped out of the gatehouse were mortals. After the brothers presented themselves, they made us wait for no little time. Then the portcullis was raised and we were allowed in. The gate yard was narrow and as unornamented as the walls. This tall, stone-faced tower of the keep looked no more inviting. A small troop of soldiers conducted us to the door of the great hall. When it opened, we were greeted by what I thought first must be a noblewoman of the Zidaya. It was only as I drew closer to her that I saw the color of her skin, a much paler gold than a Hakatri's or Inaluki's, and realized she was not of either clan, but was instead one of my own Tanukadaya folk. Her gown was modest homespun, but she carried herself like a great lady. I could not take my eyes off her. Something about her even reminded me of my master's mother, Lady Amarasu, not the woman's features so much as her calm self-possession. Enter, Lord Akatri, and Lord Inaluki, she said. Be welcome, guests. I am Saruyan Ona, mistress of this house. My husband will come down to you soon. She smiled. It almost, seem, it almost seemed as though she directed that smile at me, though I knew I must be mistaken, then gestured for us to follow her into the dark, modest hall. When we were seated, she sent servants to fetch us refreshment. After we had been served with food and wine, she told us she had pressing tasks to see to, but that her husband would join us very soon. Then, to my surprise, she looked straight at me and said, you too are most welcome here, fellow child of the garden. Dinsunno sabbeavau ya uluru. I had no idea what those last words meant. I could only stare in confusion as she walked away. Iniluki turned to my master, saying, I had heard the exile took one of the ocean children for a bride, but I thought it only another fanciful tale. Still, she is pretty enough. I would not chase her from my bedchamber. Hakatri frowned. We are guests, brother. Before Inaluki could reply, a very tall figure appeared in the inner doorway of the hall, accompanied by several soldiers. Inaluki jumped up. He might even have closed his fingers around the hilt of his sword, but Hakatri put a hand on his arm. Greetings! Lord Zaniko, my master said, rising and bowing. My brother and I thank you for your hospitality and your time. All I have offered you so far is bread and salt, the newcomer said in a deep, slow voice. Whether I give you anything else depends on what you have to say. Zaniko was one of the tallest people I have ever seen. The top of his white-haired head loomed a full hand span above those of my master and his brother, who were considered of good size among their own people. Zaniko wore only black, and he had the deathly pale skin of all his Hikidaya clansmen. His snowy flesh looked so thin as to be almost translucent, suggesting advanced age, but his bearing was surprisingly youthful, his movements precise but graceful. He gestured for Hakatri and Inaluki to sit, but he remained standing. So, he said, speak. Have you come to redress some wrong you think I have done your house? Inaluki made a sound that almost sounded like a laugh, but Hakatri ignored him, saying, We have no interest in old slights and old grievances, my lord. We come to you because we were told you might be able to help us. Zaniko looked at him as if with no real interest. I doubt it, and I certainly have no desire to help any of the Sansere, in any case. But this is not a matter of clans or houses, said my master. This is a matter of concern for all living things. We seek your wisdom, Zaniko, say Hamaka, because a great worm has come down into the land south of here, and has already taken many lives, mortals and Kedaya alike. 
Zaniko's lip curled. It is amusing, in a way, how it is only when one clan wants something from the other that the old word, Kedaya, is brought out and dusted off. But your folk and mine are not one people any more, as you know, and I have no allegiance to either clan. So we have heard. Inaluki's tone made his brother squeeze his arm again, but Inaluki ignored him. They say you call yourself the Exile, and want nothing to do with either our clan or your own. What of it? asked Zaniko, cold as his windy mountain top. I do not dwell in their lands or in yours, unless Year Dancing House and its meddling master and mistress have now declared this place to be their fiefdom. If we have already run out of things to discuss, you Zidaya princelings should be on your way as swiftly as possible. The way he said this made me look anxiously toward the soldiers still standing in the doorway. They, too, were mortals, which seemed strange to me, but they looked well-armed and strong and not afraid of even two dawn children as famed as my master and Inaluki. I beg pardon for my brother's unconsidered words, began Hikatri. Do not apologize for me, my master went on, as if Inaluki had not spoken. But, as I said, we did not come here to air old grievances, Lord Zaniko. Hidohebi has come down out of the north, and Lady Vinadarta of Skyglass Lake told us that you, of all living folk, would be most able to advise us how to deal with this beast. Not by brave charges or stirring songs, said Zaniko. No, I have nothing to offer you, Sansere. Still, you may spend the night. The road down is too steep and treacherous even to walk upon in darkness. Thank you, Lord Zaniko. Go and see to the arrangements, Pamon, Hakatri told me. The lady of the house was waiting in the chamber outside. I bowed to her and asked where I should put my master's things. She only looked at me for a long time, until I became dismayed. Yanum doksin ro danabir, she said at last. It was complete nonsense to me. I beg your pardon, my lady, but I don't understand. I'm sorry she said, but I found her expression odd and unsettling. I asked, what is your name? I am called Pamon, my lady. Not your family's name. Your name. I was surprised. Not even my master addressed me by anything other than my family name. Kess, my lady. I apologize for staring at you. It has just been so long since I saw a male of my own kind. That was my people's tongue I spoke. Your people's, too, since we are of the same kind. I confess I did not recognize it. But that is strange, Kess. Are you and the lords you serve not from Azua? To put a finer edge on it, my lady, I serve Hakatri the elder brother. But yes, Azua is our home. And do none of our people there still use the old tongue we Tanukadaya brought from the garden? I shrugged. I do not doubt some do, mistress. Certainly many Tanukadaya live there, but they do not speak much about old days and old things. As for me, I never learned any such things, and my parents, if they knew, did not teach me. I was uncomfortable and suddenly a bit ashamed by something that was no fault of my own. I take it from what you said earlier that Tanukadaya are rare in this part of the world. In this particular part, yes. As you have seen, all our servants and guards are mortals. I was curious about that, so I did something rare for me. I asked her a question that a mere servant should not ask a noble woman. Was that by your choice, my lady? She shook her head. No. 
That was my husband's doing. I think he did it for me, however. He thought I would not want to see my people forced to serve. And do you feel more comfortable with mortal servants? She made a gesture I did not recognize, though it stirred a dim memory. There is no easy answer to that. And what of you, Kess? Are you happy in service to the Dawn children? To the Zidaya? Me. Very well. To be rude, she said. Let me ask it another way. Are you happy in your life? I found this astonishing. Of course. I told you I have been lucky beyond almost any of my kind. Of our kind, my lady. As have you, it seems, if you will pardon me for speaking when it is not my place. Your place? She laughed, which I did not understand. Yes, I suppose I have done well for myself in this world. I have found a mate who does not despise my heritage. The rest of his kind are not so forgiving, though, which is why we live in this out-of-the-way spot. I am told that the Cloud Children banished your husband from Nakiga. Yes, but your Zediah masters would not have us either, Kess. The people of my husband's clan and your masters once could live together, but it was never truly accepted that either of them might marry one of our kind. I did not know what to say. I had never considered such things, and until that moment I could not have imagined it. Why would one of the immortals want to marry one of my race instead of one of their own? I know nothing about such things, my lady, was all I said. I have discomforted you, I fear. Her smile looked sad. Still, I wish to ask you one more discomforting question. Why do you serve Lord Hakatri and his brother? Because they are good to me, I said, then amended it to, Lord Hakatri has always been good to me. I do not know why I qualified my response. Inaluki had always treated me well enough, as well as he treated any of his inferiors, whether Zidaya or Tinukadaya. Yes, but why do you serve him? Why is Hakatri the master and you the minion? Again, I did not understand her question. Because we ocean children have always served the dawn children, since back in the garden. Ah, she nodded. And your master's dawn children revere the memory of the garden. They celebrate the garden, even long after they left it behind. She leaned closer, a strangely intent look on her face. But our people were the garden. Before I could even try to make sense of this, her husband, Zaniko, emerged from the great hall of the keep with my master and Inaluki. They seemed to be arguing. I owe nothing to anyone, but I owe less than nothing to the house of year dancing, Zaniko said with a face full of bitterness. In any hap, my days of struggling against the great worms are over. Have you lost your courage, then? Inaluki's handsome face was flushed with anger, the gold of his cheeks suffused with a mild bloom of sunset red. Brother, I bid you be silent said Hakatri in a voice soft but sharp. Do not insult our host. It seemed that Inaluki would say something more, but a look passed between the two of them, and the younger brother turned away. Lord Zaniko, my master said, forgive us. We have been discourteous, I fear. We do not ask you to join us. We want only your advice, your wisdom, you are known for your brave deeds and the songs of your fight against the fire drake called Snare Worm. Say that you faced it by yourself and killed the terrible creature with only a witchwood spear. What can we learn from you? Zaniko looked at my master for a long, silent moment, then at Inaluki, who stood regarding a wall tapestry of birds and branches 
as though it were the most engaging sight he had encountered in a long time. "'Come with me,' he said at last. Hakatri signaled me to accompany them. Saniko's wife bowed and went out. We followed the exile out of the keep and toward the stables, where our horses were kept with those of the household. For a moment I thought Zaniko would order us to take our mounts and go, but instead he pointed up toward the stable's high, slanted ceiling. In the rafters hung a great witchwood spear, as big around as my master's strong forearm, and more than twice his height in length. "'Do you see the black stains along the shaft?' Zaniko asked. Those are from the snare worm's blood. I trow that that dried blood would burn your flesh. That is why it is hung there, out of reach. And do you see how heavy the spear is? How thick? My master and his brother stared up at the long, dark thing. It looks a mighty weapon, Hakatri said at last. It had to be, and even so it was almost not strong enough. It bent like an archer's bow while I held it braced against the earth until the beast was close enough to spew its foul stench into my face before it died. I am only here because the snare worm had no fire left to belch, but that did not keep it from burning me. He pulled off one of his gauntlets and held up his hand. It was misshapen, the white skin covered with ropey red flesh, and the two smallest fingers melted together like candle wax. A few drops of the dragon's blood did that, scorched through my mailed gauntlet as though it were the thinnest parchment. Witchwood will not burn at the touch of dragon blood, but all else... But still you killed it said Inaluki, looking at Zaniko's hand with more fascination than horror. Surely that is all that matters. You killed the snare worm. And if you help us, we will kill the black worm. Zaniko shook his head. The snare worm was young, and only ten paces or so in length. Even the great Hamako worm slayer himself could not kill Hidohebi. Golden Karuka Mao's deadly progeny with only a witchwood spear. Inaluki, always full of feeling, cried, But you yourself say you killed dragons with a spear. Surely Hamako was greater than you. Now Zaniko again grew cold and calm. Yes, I do not doubt it. But Hamako, the worm slayer, was aware of many things which you are not, young master of all truth. And so am I. Hakatri interposed himself between his brother. Please, our people are in danger. Many around Silverholm and in the north have been killed by this beast. And not only our own kind. Many mortals like those who serve you here have suffered and died in this monster's jaws. For the first time, I saw the hardness in Zaniko's face soften, if only slightly, though his voice was still harsh. Mortals? You would concern yourself with mere mortals. Inaluki made a noise of disgust. I would not stand by and see them destroyed by such a foul beast, said my master. They are not our kind, but they have a right to live. Zaniko looked at him so long, I wondered if he would ever speak again. Very well, he said at last. I will tell you what I know. And the first and most important is this. What Hamako and the other worm slayers back in the garden knew, and what I know, is that when a worm is young, the places between its scales are still tender. A sharp spear can pierce those places, especially if the beast itself drives against the spear, with all its weight and strength. But as they grow, the dragon's hides become harder and harder until their armor is like bronze, even between the scales. He gestured up toward the ceiling of the stable again. Hamako himself 
might have wielded that spear but against a worm who has lived as many years as ill-famed Hidohebi, it would have snapped like a dry twig, and even the worm slayer would have been worm food. So that is why all this talk is bootless. There is not a spear you could lift that would be strong enough to pierce its flesh. With that, he turned and led us out of the stables and back toward the keep. Uh, I'm going to start this next section. My master's people hardly sleep, although when they choose to do so, or are forced to it by some great exhaustion, they may sleep for a long time. But I am not of their kind. I sleep nearly every night. So it was strange for me on that first night in Raven's Perch to find myself so utterly unable to find rest. No single idea beset me, but rather many ideas. The murderous worm, Kai Unyu shamed and mocked by Inazashi, the angry faces of the bent and crooked Tanuka Daya, who had wished to harm me only because I was dressed like my Zedaya masters, Woven through all these memories, like thread of a single but noteworthy color, was Lady Ona, speaking to me in a tongue I did not understand, but which she said was my own. Each time I drifted down into something like sleep, it was only a short while before I again bobbed up into wakefulness in the small chamber. After hours of such frustrations, I finally rose from the bed. I peered into my master's chamber and saw that he was awake, reading from a pile of scrolls that Lord Zaniko had given him. He looked up. Pamon, have you seen my brother? No, my lord. His eyes strayed back to the scroll. If you see him, ask him to come to me tomorrow in the morning. There are things he and I must discuss. I, I will, my lord. Since my master had already returned to his reading and did not look likely to need me for anything else, I went quietly away from the apartments. Wrapping myself in my cloak, I climbed up the stairs, past nodding mortal sentries, headed for the top of the keep because I badly wanted to stand beneath the sky and let my head clear. But as I neared the landing of the uppermost floor, I almost stumbled into two shadowy figures standing so close that I feared at first I had disturbed a pair of lovers. The larger figure turned toward me. I recognized Inaluki. A moment later, the smaller figure tried to slip away, but Inaluki moved to prevent it, keeping himself between me and what I now took to be a female in an embroidered cloak and hood, possibly Lady Ona herself. I was stunned and alarmed by this thought, and at first could not imagine what I should do. But as I stared at her, my master's brother moved again to keep her where she had been. I was seized with the need to do something. M my lord, I said loudly. What is it, Pamon? Inaluki's words were flat and harsh. He looked at me as he might look at a stain on his garment. I did something I had never done before, and have never done since. I told a deliberate lie to one of my master's family. Your brother urgently desires to speak with you. Now? Truly? I could barely meet his gaze and had only the courage to nod. Inaluki flicked his fingers in a gesture of annoyance, then turned away from the hooded figure and went past me down the stairs without a backward glance. When I turned... The female figure was already moving swiftly down the hallway. She opened a creaking door and shut it behind her. Not quite certain what I had interrupted, and sick with worry about what would happen when my master's brother learned of my deception, I made my way up to the roof of the keep. And I think I'm going to stop there, because there's a long stretch before there's another good stopping place. So that's where I'm going to stop. I see I've gone out of focus somehow while I was not paying attention. It's so sad when you go out of focus.
it's been 20, 25 years since I was last in focus. A lot of things have changed. Anyway, so with that, let me see what's going on here. Make sure we are still online. Yeah, it looks like it stopped. Um, no, but it looks like it's still going. Um, okay, that's good. Um, I am going to wrap it up here. So I will say I'm going to be back 7 p.m. to read some more. Um, I particularly like this next section because Pamon gets to meet uh, and find out more about his own people. Um, so I hope those of you who can will join me and those of you who can't can listen to it on YouTube or on my Facebook pages. Uh, we've given up on Twitter because Twitter is not allowing links now to other apps. I, excuse me while I roll my eyes. Oh, God. Uh, anyway, so with that then, um, I will only say to take good care of yourselves because you are important, not just to yourselves and your loved ones, but to me too. Take good care of yourselves. Here, let me show you poor Johnny who's down here. Where are you, John? There he is. Poor Johnny, looking very worried with the worried dog eyes. Say hello, John. Johnny's not going to say hello because he doesn't want anybody to see what he looks like when he's worried. But he's always worried. Uh, anyway, so with that, I will say again, thank you for joining me. Take good care of yourselves, people around you. I will see you very soon. Um, many of you I will see tomorrow at 7. Um, and I, as always, I thank you for spending time with me. It's a pleasure. So peace. Good night. Sleep well. I am going to go soothe a nervous dog. <laughs> Be well. Stupid people make their stupid noises, setting off fireworks.